Hey, everybody, and welcome back to the Madness Continues podcast. I'm excited today. I'm interviewing, uh, this took place months ago, by the way, so apologies to to Matt Griffo, who is the subject of this interview today. Matt's uh, a really, really talented dude. I met him in London at the Troubadour. We were both doing comedy at one of the weirdest comedy shows I've ever done stand-up at. It was super bizarre, and uh, we talk about it a little bit in the show. Matt is a musical comedian. He's very talented. He's an improviser. He's uh, done. He does comedy and teaches it, especially musical improv, all over the world. He really has like the actual setup. I'm jealous of how freaking cool his setup is in terms of what he can just basically bring about in his life. Uh, I want the same kind of setup, uh, gearing for it. So, you know, share this. <laughs> Get Help me build my audience, everybody. <laughs> uh, back in New York, which I'm excited about. That's the update for, your, for everybody on this thing. I'm back in uh, the Big Apple. So if you're in New York, get at me, man. I'm going to be at the stand a lot and at uh, Stand Up New York and at uh, pretty much everywhere else. I think New York Comedy Club, probably my big three. So uh, thank you so much for listening. I appreciate it. Guys, without any further ado, uh, here is the interview with Matt Griffo. set up here it's it's really impressive no oh, thanks man uh i'm re- i should let you know matt griffo i'm recording uh welcome to madness continues podcast matt griffo hey uh thanks for coming over man i uh let me just adjust i should have done this right is before. there audio that i need to listen to for this i or mean just I actually not need just, just monitor just monitoring yourself you don't really need them but it's nice to hear your hear your voice Ten, what tends to happen and it probably won't happen with you because you're a a seasoned performer <laughs> is uh, what tends to happen is that people come in here and they sit down on the on this thing to record and then they end and they up forget that there's a microphone. Yeah, and they get their they get all the way way back in the seat, all the way back here talking on the I'm not good on the pod, it. and then I that's why I'm always like, can you please put those in your ears? Because then they what tends to happen I'll is they just in. lean way back and then uh and then and then they'll never then i have to keep jet then i have to keep like gesturing them for them to come forward and they're like what the fuck are you doing right but i mean you know what you're doing you know your way around a microphone i do uh so matt griffo you and i met in uh london interestingly what a weird show that was what that was one of the weirdest com- comedy shows i've ever been involved with in my life it was it the or because it for me it was just one of the weirdest it might be the weirdest to me, and it, it and it wasn't. I mean, I've been involved with some real fucking <laughs> barn burners, but that was a bit. This was at the Troubadour, uh, which is a famous, an actual famous, mm. uh, like, place in a. Is a it was a fa- yeah, it's a famous bar. Yep. And there's one part that's restaurant, and there's another part that's just an open kind of pub area. Yep. And uh, there was no one. In like we came out on the call time, but there's no one there, and then <laughs> I didn't know what was happening. I just knew there was another American that was there, and then I got booked for it from a. I don't remember who what her name was, but she was like, "Here's this other show if you want to do it," and I just thought, "Well, I'm free. Why not?" So why it's not? A, and it's a famous club. Yeah, the, the so Troubadour I, is a famous club. I thought, yeah, that sounds that's fun. where the, the Rolling Stones used to play there. The Beatles used to play there. Right. There's all these like bands that used to play there, and so it it was funny because when I got that situation, I was like, oh, this is gonna be great, and then yeah, so I I went in and I was confused, and then there was a I was there was a a French girl there. Yep. And then there was a that was it actually. <laughs> <laughs> that's actually it. And uh, there wasn't even the people that were running it weren't there. And then eventually they came, and I was like, "What's happening?" And they said, "There's there might be a show." Yeah, there's supposed. That was the weirdest part about it. There is might it be. It started like an hour late or more, and there was uh, we were just hanging out in this in the in the. I I, I kept I kept feeling. And here's the weirdest part about this for me. One, you had been doing a tour, I should say. This isn't for me, but you had been doing it. You had been in Europe for a while mm-hmm. and kind of had done a tour. Teaching musical improv, if I recall. Yeah, I was I was teaching musical improv in different 
countries in you know Dublin, Copenhagen, uh, Oslo, Norway, and, and Hamburg, Germany, Hamburg, Germany, and uh, yeah, between performing and and also teaching. And I was in London because there was a person who was a booker there who had who had booked me for a Croatian tour. Uh huh. And that one was was actually great. It was there was a driver, there were multiple comedians, and we were getting paid to perform all these places the hotels were booked out yeah so it, that's that awesome was, that was really nice and so i thought well that was good so this other thing will probably be good <laughs> so, <laughs> i get there it was extremely opposite from my croatia experience yeah there's no one and then the comedians were uh i don't know it awful was weird awful they were but it was it was they were performing in a way of ah uh, they were performing in a way of like no one is here. Like it looked like it was like they were alone in their bedroom and they were they were just doing their best. Yeah, and I was like, "We're here." In my mind, I was like, "We're here. We're there's an audience here." <laughs> yeah, there are actual people in this room. And then are... there was one of them was like, uh, "Do you guys feel like uh, you want to hear another one?" And I was like, "No." And then, <laughs> would, and then he, I, I was just like honest. I was like, "No, I don't." Please. The, the host of the show kept. This is uh, this has gone on so long. We're already already belaboring this story, but I, it's just so funny to recount it because I haven't really thought about it much since this happened. But I just remember trying to relate this to people and being like, the 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 host of the show mm-hmm. was a strange guy in himself, and the energy was so low, and he like so didn't. Do, low. He just was. It was almost like we were literally. It was like hanging out in a fucking heroin basement, mm-hmm. and somebody just was like, "All right, so we're gonna." You know, let's do some comedy, guys. And the girl that spoke French didn't really understand much of what was happening. No, well, lucky her. Lucky I think I remember her. saying that to her. I'm like, you really are very lucky that you don't understand what's happening because this is fucking awful. And uh, I hung yep. out. I had gotten off of an airplane. I flew from Chicago to London and uh, got got off the airplane, went straight to the office I was working at, worked all day, uh, didn't sleep on the airplane, really, on mm-hmm. the way over, um, got out of the office, went to the Troubadour... <laughs> And then went into that show, which mm. was already running like super fucking late. I don't think really we got late. out of it until like eleven something. It went really long. They, yeah, one, I remember one of the comedians who was, who was like, I who kept talk, he kept talking about how he'd been performing at really big events and they were really great and really great audiences. And I completely believe him. Yeah, because that absolutely happens where you do some huge show. Yeah, and then you do another show and there's no one there. That that absolutely happens. But what you don't do. Is berate the lack audience of audience at. that's there about you guys like, suck. You guys suck. When they're like, well, there's three it's, people here. It's really shitty that three of you aren't 300. <laughs> Why are you doing a 45 minute set for like four people? Yeah, it was super weird. And that was basically, and there was another dude. There was like some like really good comic guy who like came in, but then they kept bumping everybody because like mm-hmm. they would like some comedian would show up that the host was like friends with. He'd be like, yeah, man, I like Tim's going to get up and do his set, man. Tim, Tim, whatever. And then Tim would get up and it would suck. It would, and would and it went on for set. like 20 minutes. Yeah. And I, I just was like, it was so disrespectful. There was a part of me that I think I even got up on stage and was like, fuck this. You're I actually a- did. I actually did only three songs, I think. Yeah. Like you, I did you a, got up, I, went quick. They said, I, you're going to do eight to 10 minutes. And I was like, cool. And I did it. And I got off. Yeah. And I think you were the only one who did his like time. I did exactly then... what it was. And I left. I was like, I didn't leave, but I got off stage. And I was like, there we go. I, same thing as I think I, I got up and did. I think Your set I did. was energetic. You were also like also at the same time berating the other comedians. It was stage. awful. Yeah. It was which now I've become kind of famous for, I think, in, in, in Chicago is getting up and yelling at the other comic slash audience. But I was surprised. I was like, well, here's the American. <laughs> There he is. Getting up on stage thinking he knows what comedy is. <laughs> you guys, what kind of show is this? You guys are just going. You were like literally, what we're saying now is you were saying on stage, but really energized. Yeah. And never the, the, Brit, should, the, the polite to... <laughs> British didn't know what to do about it. I need to post that recording on this podcast. I was podcast. just thinking, wow, this is. You fucking guys. I just got so worked up. <laughs> this and is I think I was like, bye, and then dropped the mic like on the floor or something. Quintessential American <laughs> here. It was the worst. It was one of the weirdest and worst comedy shows I've ever done. The other ones that I did in London were pretty good, but that one at the Troubadour. And you know what's funny about it is that's such a nice venue that I list that on my resume when I send that's like funny. stuff to bookers. Is I'm really? like, you have done the Troubadour, and people are like, oh, that's a great, yeah, it's a really good, really, <laughs> yeah. I've never, I've never, I'd never, I don't want to tell anybody about that. Uh, <laughs> how was that show? Well, let uh, me tell you a story, sir. 
yeah, it's uh, it was a uh, yeah, it was a bad situation. But it's nice to have you over here, and uh, it was cool to connect with you in that situation because my you've been uh, indelibly uh, burned into my mind as a guy who's just a cool. <laughs> Like, uh, I'm over it slash international music comic, like, you know. I, I don't think I'm over it. I just understand what it is. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I'm just like, here it is. So how did you So how did you get into improv? When did you start performing? When did you start performing musical improv? I started, I'm 34 now. Uh-huh. I started doing. You do not look 34, by the way. Sweet. Uh, my None of my family looks their age. Um, That's great. My, That's a good skill to have. It's a good, good job, Graham. Um. <laughs> So, I started performing improv in high school, and I made it. A, I made a improv team. Uh huh. And so when I was like sixteen, I started, which is like in the what two thousands. Uh, it would have been oh two probably. Like that. Yeah, it's easy. My birthday is eighty five, so it's a nice easy number <laughs> for math. Uh, yeah, you're probably oh one oh two then. Mm, uh yeah yeah somewhere around there. So I started doing improv. I was like I'd play piano. Yep. And I would also I was on the team, but I would also like jump back and forth between playing the piano and and doing that and going on stage. And Wh- then where 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 was this? It was in it was in Rochester, New York. In, Got it. Uh, okay. Yeah, by Canada. Did you have an improv like club or yeah? Like... We made a improv club called Joker's Wild. We and did you, and you guys put it. on shows at your own high school? We would put on shows that we were not supposed to do really but they just kind of let us do it and we would charge a dollar and we would make a lot of money off of it yeah and it was great so this is really similar to my story actually i don't know if we talked about this before i started doing comedy when i was 14 i started doing improv and i had a teacher an art teacher at my high school who started going to second city in detroit Mm. and decided he wanted to start this. In Novi. Yeah, in Novi, Michigan. Yeah, mm-hmm. no longer there, but was for a while. Mm-hmm. And he uh, he brought... Now there's Go Comedy. I'm sure you've done comedy there. I, nope, I have not really? gone back to that place. Have you never? <laughs> oh, wow, okay. Well, there was Improv Inferno for a while in uh, Ann Arbor. And then they the guys... That closed. And then uh, the same guys who were kind of in the leadership group there opened Go Comedy in Ferndale, Michigan, which is at Nine Mile and Woodward, if memory serves. Mm-hmm. And... Uh, they run stuff out of there now and they're kind of the whole they're the whole that's the top of the improv community out there i think mm. um that and i think the independent comedy club in hamtramck which formerly was planet ant that's where keegan michael key came from by the way correct and so anyway um where this is just you know aside from diving down the weird <laughs> sordid history of detroit improv uh he started my my art teacher started this club in high school a similar kind of thing and i just started doing improv at this club and we did same thing shows like monthly every couple mm-hmm. months and we charged two dollars and we'd sell out the theater every time we did it yep and there's like nothing to do yeah. when you're that age so it was a bunch of high schoolers that were just so excited to like see people other other people their own age making fun of all the things that they're that they also about. hate yeah so. and it, it was super popular and the same thing is the administration didn't want us to do it didn't like didn't really like us and tried to like close us down because people would say like damn on stage every once in a while or mm-hmm. refer to the existence of sex and <laughs> that was like it, yeah it yeah and th- uh, it was just weird so very similar then yeah and so it really kind of bothered the school community which gained even gained us even more popularity right and so that was the whole I didn't know that you had done that for that I've never met anybody else who started in high school yeah well I and mean, we did it ourselves yeah we, we and then we just taught. The te- the person who was the teacher, we were like, here's how the games go. You don't need to do so anything funny. other than just be here so that we are allowed to do it. Yeah. And so they would be like, cool. Because they just liked watching us goof around and yeah. to practice the improv exercises and stuff. And so they would, because th- we needed for the school to have it, they we needed somebody as a supervisor. Uh, yeah. That was it. You needed it. The, the one supervisor faculty. didn't know anything and about he, improv. Did he, did he like show up? Did he even yeah, stick he was, around? Yeah, it was great. Eventually, his, his name was John Edwards, and he was, he was so great. And then he eventually, we would have him be a part of the games. And That's fun. He was great. He was he was like 25 at the time. Oh, so this is actually really similar because my art teacher was 22 or 23. He was like the youngest teacher the school had like hired in mm-hmm. a long time. Yeah. And so it was a similar kind of thing, except he like led stuff, but it was fascinating because he had just started doing improv himself mm-hmm. and he just thought, I'll just do this at the school because I'll just have Which very another fun. outlet to do it. Right. That makes sense. And uh, yeah, really funny. And, but a lot of the same things, what was like, we all kind of were learning it together mm-hmm. and he had like Violas Bolin's 
you know, improv for the theater book. Uh-huh. And we followed a ton of games in that. His So all of his stuff was, like, really character-driven, character-based, like a lot of character study stuff, rather than, you know, if you go to Second City or IO or Annoyance or Comedy Sports Now, I feel like a lot of their stuff is less theater-oriented. A lot of his stuff was, like, very theater-oriented yeah. to begin with. Where When I took class, do you know Michael Gelman? Uh, no. When I took classes with Michael Gelman, he was part of the. He was on the main stage back in the seventies. Yeah, I think maybe eight, maybe early seventies or early eighties. <laughs> and seventies um, <laughs> or early eighties. <laughs> Matt just did exactly the thing I was talking um, about earlier with the go. microphone. <laughs> and seventies um, or early eighties, and his he's comes from a major theater background, and so Gelman was a definitely used a lot of Spolin's. Work. Oh yeah, well, it's fascinating stuff to do. I started doing it in my day job. I was having uh, a lot of my salespeople to go through like a lot of those exercises mm-hmm. because a lot of it is just it's it's fascinating the stuff, especially for the theater because like a lot of the stuff that like is focused on in terms of like games where you like find the game or find the whatever like that stuff is really useful. Right. But like a lot of the character based stuff is just like helps you be a person in life. I feel like. And yeah. So, listening. Yeah, yeah, listening. <laughs> listening. Yeah, listening. And uh, I think the, you know, not denying, yes and, like all this kind of stuff is just really very simple things to understand for right. life. Um, yeah, we, uh, it's funny though, because we did, it's kind of, it sounds like it was similar. Sorry to keep belaboring this point, but it's like we would, in the summertime, it was a whole group of kids who really loved doing this improv stuff. And to the point where, when school got out in the summertime, we would still meet up like weekly or t- twice a week just to do practices. And there's no teacher, there's no adults, there's nothing. We would just self organize and, and do this stuff because we just enjoyed doing it so much. Mm-hmm. And like it got kind of wacky. Like we started doing before improv everywhere, we were doing shit like walking around the center of uh, my hometown, just following random people around in like a in like the park, m- imitating their walks and stuff. That's amazing. Like that that's the kind of shit that we would end up doing. That's so fun. The what what are your your listeners? What kind of are what are they interested in? Uh mostly my listeners are fictional. Um they they don't exist in real life. Um <laughs> these all kinds of stuff, man. I get people here from all over. I got a lot of Chicago community people, some New York people, some listeners from Kingston, Jamaica, the Russian Federation, Denmark, Sweden, a bunch of people for some reason in Brighton. In yeah. England, and then I mean, there's just they're kind of all over the place. Mm. Lots of people come here for the interviews with porn stars, and then they stay for nothing else. They leave right after that. But <laughs> well, that's cool. I mean, if you if uh, yeah, what, so what the topic? What are the topics that you want to talk about? Is the question? Well, I just kind of was enjoy. You know, we can just keep talking about. It. I'm fascinated at how you kind of developed into you know getting to the point where you're going around the world. You know, talking, doing musical oh. improv and teaching it to people. Oh, I think that's, that's kind of amazing. Great. Yeah. Um, capitalism, I think, is <laughs> is the answer. Uh, I mean, because I love teaching. I love teaching. Sure. But I, when I was a kid, I would listen to comedy music. Like I would listen to Tom Lehrer, who is a musical comedian from the fifties and sixties, and he's a he play piano and and do comedic lyrics that were social satire. Tom Lehrer is he the guy who wrote "Hello Mother, Hello Father"? Is that him? No, that was actually just a dude who used to go to parties with his friends and then it's, I, this is how much of a music comedy nerd I am. You actually fucking know this? Yeah. yeah he would, okay. they would, I uh, thought you were just making this up. No, no, this is true. Uh, he would go to the song he's talking about. It goes, it's to actually classical music. It's to our crestal piece, um, famous piece, but it goes, uh, hello, mother, hello, father. Here I am at Camp Granada. Camp is very entertaining. Something, something, that yeah. it goes something. But starts I think we have some fun when it stops raining. Yeah. <laughs> take me home, oh mother, father, take me home. I promise I will not make noise or mess the house with other boys. This is basically a song about a kid who's who's writing a letter to his parents about not wanting to be at camp. Yeah, yeah. And so the reason that that was written and why how it happened was these these people who were parents would like have get-togethers at their house. They would listen in the background. Would be. Uh, records of uh-huh. orchestral music and then for fun they would write parody lyrics they would write lyrics to the orchestral music that was, as com- a, that was funny that's great and they had so there's multiple 
songs that they that guy and multiple parents had written uh-huh. and then eventually like somebody was like this is really funny you should actually record this yeah. and so they they had him like go to the orchestra because the orchestra already knows the pieces that's funny and then they just had him and then it became really popular and then recorded it that's uh, that is so interesting because the orchestra already had it all set up to record yeah because they already know these tunes they don't right. have to learn anything nope that's so amazing. that was why that became really famous. Anyway, Tom Lehrer, though, he would do social satire like the Masochism Tango, or he would do um, uh, the Vatican Rag, which is like about... An, like, an old, like an old Weird Al Yankovic. It was original songs. <laughs> okay, got it. Weird, does... Weird, Weird, Weird Al writes some originals. He does, but he's famous for his parodies. You're right. That's where, that's where he, he is well known. I will stop interrupting you. This is interesting to, for, to hear about. Tom Lehrer is is known for original comedic lyrics. Uh, or there's also um, National Brotherhood Week, which is about... There was a thing that used to be in existence called National Brotherhood Week, uh-huh. which is the reason of National Brotherhood Week was to say, hey, everybody who is a different race, we need to come together and be nice. Mm. And so National Brotherhood Week was a thing that didn't didn't go great which is why it doesn't exist anymore uh but he wrote a song making fun of national brotherhood week because i i don't remember how the i know the chorus like national brotherhood week national but where uh where and puerto ricans dancing cheek to cheek you can harmonize uh with someone you despise <laughs> um it's something i forget how it goes but it's basically about like this isn't working yeah all these people hate each other <laughs> um but it was that but what is great about him is he he is absolutely about equality and he's absolutely about pointing out the flaws in society yeah and and just an artificial week of people doing that was not a great way to Right to, to draw right. everybody That's what together, he felt. and uh, yeah, so he played. It was just piano and vocal, and that was him. But anyway, so uh, as a kid, I'd listen to that. I'd grow up wanting to do comedy. Yeah, but I also loved doing music. So I I moved to like, Chicago in 2005. And quickly, I played piano in between classes, and then the head music director of the training center saw me playing, Mike Dakota, and then he asked me if he I wanted to be trained as a music director, and I said uh, yes, and. <laughs> I could get because I could get free classes. Sure, it was an internship at the time, and so I became an intern. He was training me how to become a music director. I got free classes. I kept taking more classes because then the other classes were like half off. And what? That's great. And because I was an intern, that was really an educational thing. And then I started to teach at Second City, and I was I was twenty years old at the time. I started teaching there, and then I started to music direct for what was at the time called Brown Co., which is now called the Urban Urban Twist. It's called Ur- Brown Co. because it was it was an ethnic, uh, it was the Outreach and Diversity Company of Second City. Got it. And so they would uh, they do race based sketch material. Uh huh. And Brown Co. was the title because of Red Co., Green Co., Blue Co. So it was a, it was satirizing those names. Got it. Okay. And then they eventually changed it because people felt weird about it. Yeah, I mean, I, <laughs> I still think it's funny. I, Brown I, Coast, I think, is kind of funny. It yeah, feels like that should have a resurgence. It's poking fun at the other Yeah, titles. the other titles around the thing. So you got to do, I, man, that's like the that's like the velvet glove treatment, dude, doing the music director and then getting uh, some classes. That's pretty dope. Yeah, it was pretty great. So how long did that, but what year was that and how long did that go on for? I was I was teaching and music directing until 2010, 2000 yeah about 2009 2010 because i i was really i realized i was being pigeonholed as only a piano player ah uh, you know because there's a ton of improvisers yep there's, they, there's a million of those but for piano players good piano players they were more limited mm. and so they were like well we we need this guy on piano we have a ton of people that can go on stage and do the make em yeah 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 so I was getting really frustrated with that. And so I was eventually like, I'm done. And I told Mike, who had hired me, it was like, I quit. Yeah. And he was really mad because <laughs> he'd spent a lot of time. Did it, could it come out of nowhere? Or like, did you have it, conversations it, with I him? I had about had this? conversations, but it, 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 I had conversations and he was like, no, it's okay. This is why it's working. And then I, I was like, no, it's not. And so I, I was like, I'm going to, I'm not doing music directing anymore. And got it. Yeah. And then I, and then I went on to work for Tour Co for a bit. And the Green Co. Company, and I, I didn't. I really disliked that too. Um, Why? How come? I feel like that's what a lot of people. That's like the the goal for a lot of people is to work for one of the touring companies. The goal. 
It, uh, because, well, it was because I was, a, was the music director. I think if I was the uh, I was a performer on stage, there's more to do. Got it. Okay. But I was bored because got it. I'm there, and then and you're I'm only doing one thing, waiting for me to press space bar on a for a doorbell sound. <laughs> You know, and then there's, you know, I wait 30 minutes and then we have a, a three minute song. Yep. And then I'm playing piano for that. But then I press space bar on another segue track, which I'm not even playing. It's just like some recorded track. And so it was very boring for me. I was yeah. Basically just. A yeah, you weren't doing any. Yeah. You're not doing any actual improv. So in 2008, I started to do my solo comedy stuff because I was like, I really like Tom. I love Tom Lehrer and I want I love playing music. Yeah. But I also love comedy. So how do I combine those two things? So I started doing solo work, and I started performing a lot in stand-up clubs, um, and I disliked it. <laughs> yeah. What clubs? Well, at the time, so when you're saying like solo work, like what was some of the stuff that you were, you recorded an album, mm-hmm. and you had like a whole bunch of uh, other like bits that you were doing that involved, you know, music. Mm-hmm. But like what were some of the, what was like your stage performance at the time for those stand-up clubs? It was, I would say it's very similar to now. It uh-huh. was just, it was, it was more juvenile. Mm. You know, it was like, I had a song called You Bitch. It was like, <laughs> um, you always, it was, I don't remember what the hell, the hell, it's so, so long ago that I did it, but it was about it, which actually I noticed when I'm doing songwriting classes for comedic writing that this is, this tends to be one of the first songs that, that anybody writes. It doesn't matter what gender they are they will tend to write a song as one of their first comedy songs about the whatever person they're in a relationship with that's yeah, an asshole that's so funny it's and, a common and, 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 it's what, a, it must be a I mean, it's like very it's really human, great when i see experience. it i see all the different versions of it i'm like oh there it is um <laughs> it's very common for that anyway that one and there was like another one called vagina monster which was my mom's favorite song that's well, what yeah <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, when I when I do shows in my hometown, she will still be like vagina monster, and I'm like, oh my god, mom. You're like, I don't play. I haven't played that song for years, mom. Why does she? Why? Why is it her favorite song? <sighs> Just unique she's parents. A, she's a funny lady. Um, when I was 14, she 15, 14 or 15, I think when I was 14, she made a mix CD for me, and on the <laughs> CD it, it had um, Monty Python. Oh going, yeah. Um, wouldn't it? Uh, isn't it awfully nice to have a penis? Isn't, Isn't it, it awfully good to have, have a dong? dong? Yeah, I love that. that. Eric Idle. Yep. And then it also had Don't Want No Short Dick Man. Oh, yeah. And, by, uh, by, uh, what the, f- who the fuck did that? I, no clue. I can't remember. Yeah, but anyway. my dad would come into my, I remember the first time my dad came into my bedroom and was like, what, the what fuck? is happening? Because yeah. I'm dancing around and at 14 years old, I'm going, Don't Want No Short Dick. Don't, 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 sex period she talked about sex to me one time which was to tell me about the existence of sex and i think i i think i would have been okay if i had died in that moment <laughs> i think if i had just died if i had just <laughs> been struck dead that's funny i think i would be okay i think I would, everything would have been fine yeah. because i just was like i don't my mother was just the most like christian presbyterian like north midwest michigan mm-hmm. mom He's just like, well, there's this thing called sex, and you know, women have a vagina, mm-hmm. and men they put their penis in it. And I'm like, I want to fucking die. I want to die right now. That's really funny. I'm like 11, and I want to die. Like, that's I, amazing. It was, it was the most. I have trouble even talking about it now. My mom is very open about all that kind of stuff. I just can't imagine even growing up in a family like that. And my mom would put on. I remember when I was like 17, and I was, I was still in in my hometown, and she would be getting ready to go out to the club or whatever, and. She'd be like, what do you think about this? And I'd be like, maybe she'd turn around and it'd be in this sheer top. And I'd be oh like, maybe God. something that I, I, she could, oh no, I was, I'd be, no, this is later. This would be like when I was 21 and I could go out to the club with her. And she was, I would be coming from Chicago and she would have that sheer top on with a bunch of glitter. And I'd be she'd be like, what do you think? And I would be like, I maybe, <laughs> maybe something where your son can't see your boobs. And she's like, <laughs> okay. But it's good though, right? And I'm like, no, <laughs> not to me. God damn it! <laughs> so I just can't. I I I, I would want to. Sh- I literally would want to die. I'd mm-hmm. want to shoot myself in the face. So so I don't know how you fucking put up with. I don't know oh, how you did it. Uh, just you got just just what it is. <laughs> <laughs> just what it is. But so um, 
so going back, the did all that. This is like 2010, and then I just I just kept doing music and comedy. Yeah, and I started performing more for less for stand up clubs because they were not set up for music. Yeah, and well, what clubs were you back then? What clubs were you performing at? Uh, there was like Gotham Comedy Club in in New York City. Oh, so you were really doing like you were doing like club ass clubs, man? Like oh, real I was ass doing clubs. Clubs. Yeah, yeah. So how did you? So. But you, so did. you had the album out, and then you just it was because of your involvement with Second City and the tour company that had led to like kind of the opportunity to go in and do a lot of the stuff. How did you even book those gigs back then? I just messaged people. Got it. Okay. It's just tenacity. Yeah. I mean, but also I had a elbow grease. Yeah. Elbow grease, but also I I did have a background. Got it. You know, it. I could, here's my I was like, I please book me for this. Here's my website, and my website would have. It wasn't like I just was a crazy person. <laughs> <laughs> I you know my website would have good videos and good audio yeah, content. Yeah, had like good stuff, so people knew what they were. You were a known product. Yeah, yeah, it was. Yeah, it. Yeah, I couldn't. I would not have booked the gigs I booked had I just said I want to perform here. Yeah, and then they said, "Well, where's some content?" And I'd be like, "Don't, uh, don't have any." Yeah. So it wasn't like it was book nothing. me. Yeah, yeah, I I was I made sure that I kept stepping it up. That yeah. I would shoot a video. Yeah. I would edit it. And then put it up online, and then have that, and it kept increasing in, in Got quality. It. I guess what I was aiming for with that question was, uh, were you weren't like working with it, you weren't like opening for a person or something like this. No, I mean like I opened for Reggie Watts, but that was that but, didn't come, that didn't have anything else come after it. Got it. I was just got booked but, from a at a theater because there was like a whole bunch of. Uh, first of all, Reggie Watts is cool. That's amazing that you got to do that. Um, but there was this whole period of time for years where, like, musical comedy was, like, a real, like, I'm thinking Stephen Lynch and, like. This is, people always say this. Um, yeah, but there wait. was, like, a whole movement. Like, J. Chris Newberg, who's a, f- a friend of mine and started in Detroit at similar times, he was a he was a musician for years before he got into doing comedy. Yeah. And so he would get on his, he would start playing his guitar. But then Stephen Lynch became so popular that he was like, I shouldn't yeah. do this because I don't want to fall into this genre of people but there was like a handful of these people who, who there are, always are and it's generational that people think what you're saying which is that it's, yeah that it's like it happened and then it was gone but it's actually never gone yeah um but it is generational i noticed i wonder that, if that's true with all trends and there's gonna be like another jeff dunham like soon there will i'm sure <laughs> that it, but it, like i can you know back from the late 1800s yeah. there's there's different comedic musicians back to the early 1900s there's ones like there was one that go um shaving cream be nice and clean shave every day and you'll always be clean i uh i did a something to tell you i i have something to tell you it may hurt your feelings a bit but I went to the corner store and I slipped in a pile of shaving cream. <laughs> I just made those lyrics up, but it is the point so of the it's song. So the whole idea of the song. The point of yeah. the song is that you think he's going to say a bad word. Yeah. And then he says shaving cream. Because he has like Auk song, and all those like other different. It sounds like a my grandfather would sing. There's like, like a bunch would. of those um, uh, rhyme switch yeah. songs. Those are classic. Those, but those, those, that was written the, like 19... 19- Twenties. Uh, oh wow! And then it was re-recorded in the sixties by Doctor Demento. Uh, well, but, there's like a there's, but this is it's funny because like my I come from a Scottish family, and there's all these like old old recordings of like these Scot. As soon as like you know they could record audio, mm-hmm. there's all these old Scottish singers who had been wandering around the Highlands, right? And they did these kinds of yes, songs. Yes, there's a bunch of them. Yeah, actually, and it was like Especially a whole Scottish. I don't know why. Yeah, I don't know why either. It was like a whole like risque like. I love Scottish people. <laughs> yeah, right. There's a whole like risque culture of of this kind of thing for some reason in Scotland, and they would. So there's all these like old recordings that like my grandmother and my great grandmother would play. Yeah. Of like these guys who would, and it was weird because it was like they would sing a song, and then in the middle of the song they would stop and they would just talk for a while, <laughs> and it would be like a story or like, but it would have like punchlines kind of. Yeah. And they would, and it was in the Scottish accent that I couldn't so understand. But similarly, yeah. Uh, Jimmy, do you know who Jimmy Durante is? Yeah. So Jimmy Durante, similarly at the time, that was actually a really I. This is how much I know about like musical stuff. Is that in the time in the forties, it was very common for songs to have a song. They, they wouldn't even have very many, just a, maybe yeah. two or three verses. <laughs> and then in the middle, like now we have a bunch of verses, but in the middle, somebody would just talk. Yeah. They'd be like, "So, baby, 
And like there was the ink spots. The ink spots <laughs> were so a band, funny. and they would like, so here's what I got. Or they might, they might even talk the same lyrics, but it's just spoken. Yeah. But Jimmy Durante would do because he was a, he was a musician. He had, yeah. he had like a big band when he was in his twenties, and then when he was he became even really famous later in life as like old man like ha cha 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 yeah Jimmy Durante, and then <laughs> so Jimmy Durante he would he would do his bit. Where's the broads? Um, I mean like uh. Uh, but da, da, da. I'll eat up a song, and the song would be going on, and we'd be playing the piano and dancing, and and then and then suddenly in the middle, like the band's playing, like and there's some the you know beautiful ladies. This is the '50s, and so it's in black and white, and the ladies are dancing, and then he's just te- then he's just telling jokes, and he's like, "So you got a bull in a china shop, and then <laughs> the bull is running around, and you don't want the bull in the china shop, right? No. So you grab the bull by the horns, but the bull's going back, and it's going forth." And gone back and gone forth, and suddenly you look at the bull in the eyes, and then the bull goes, "Hey, I know your mother." <laughs> These are the jokes, folks. And then it would go back into, the, back song. into the song. Like this is, I'm again making that part up. But that's so but fucking funny. <laughs> there is some bit where where he did talk about a bull, but he would the like. I love Jimmy Durante's songs because they're a song, and then he goes into these random jokes. Yeah. And then if the joke doesn't hit, because you don't hear the audience, <laughs> he laugh, would just go back, back. He into would the song. go. He would. He would go back. But he would before he go. These are the jokes, folks. And then he would like, like he would apologize that way. That's what we got. That's what we got to deal with. Because he was a vaudeville performer. Oh my god! I wrote this article on Cora a while ago. Where it was I was talking about. It's funny because I think of like Henny Youngman. Like you were talking about mm-hmm. Jim Lehrer earlier, but like Henny Youngman would get on stage with a violin. Mm. And he would like almost never play it, but he would always have it. Have it. And sometimes he would be like, and he would like go to play it, and then he wouldn't play it, and then he would like start <laughs> telling jokes again. But That's he really always funny. fucking had it. Yeah. And like he, sometimes he would like do stuff, but he, uh, it was funny. But the, um, one of the first like stand up comedy sets like ever recorded on like on video was, or on video on film, it was like one of the early talkies. And it was a vaudeville performer. I forget who it is, but it's, and it's in this article. I'll link it in the show notes or whatever. But, it's funny because that's what the the show was. Was it was like I'm gonna sing and I'm gonna dance and then I'm gonna tell a story and then yeah. I'm gonna then this and then I got a couple of quick jokes for you guys and stuff. But it always had like audience interaction, so it was weird to watch it on film as yeah. a talkie because it's like there's audience interaction. That it was built for audience interaction. Yeah. Yep. But there's no audience because it's a fucking movie. Right. So like it was it was super strange to watch that because like you don't watch a movie now where the person performing said something right. they don't reference a live audience but yeah like, and when in the 50s jimmy Durante's doing it in a radio hall with an audience. with an audience but like it's it's so strange to to watch that before like people who were making that had like figured that out mm-hmm. he's on a sound stage there's no live people That's funny. and he's like what's that ma'am and you're like <laughs> nobody <laughs> nobody's here <laughs> like, what's that ma'am yeah <laughs> that's funny so uh, uh so going going forward then uh i started to teach more yeah and teach at colleges and things like that and then um, so how did you get into that then because well, it's I, like I, so there's a lot of the stuff that you were doing with comedy clubs and stuff was all just self you know d- determined yeah. and, mm-hmm. and, and put together did you did you just message colleges or improv groups or like how, how did so you put I, that I together i first got booked by a person to teach at, at columbia college in chicago and then i at, at that point i was like oh i can I can teach at the college level. Uh. It's not, it's and to me for students, it was no more intense than it was less intense than improv students who are mm. already like into it. Right. Yeah. In the world. So I realized I had the skills. I had the background. I yeah. had all of the an, a, a extreme amount of training and an extreme amount of, uh, life experience Yeah. to, to be like, here's all of what I can do. Yep. And so I, yeah, I just started contacting colleges and saying, "Hey, here's my background. Would you like me to come teach a musical improv workshop?" And they would say, "Yep." And then I would go. And the same thing is for today that if I wanted to go to Europe, I will say, "I want I'll contact like I contacted recently. I I have a friend who's in who's in Orlando. Got it. And they were like, "You should come here and play." And I was like, "I would or hang out." And I was like, "That sounds great. Is there a team that's there?" So I looked up a team that's in Orlando. I said, here's my website. Would you like me to teach? And because of my background, if I didn't have the background that I had, I couldn't do that. Yeah. They look at my website. They see all of the experiences, all the all the touring that I've done, all, all that, and videos, and it's well put together on my site. And then 
I pretty much always get something. Yes. Yeah. A win. Uh, it's always a win. Yeah. I don't actually. It's I've not never, an if. I've never a had a no. Yeah. I, yeah. I mean, I I've blank, had, I had no's no when yeah. I was like twenty. Yeah. You've gotten, but I mean, like it's never been a blanket no from a place. It's like some places will be like, yeah, yeah, sure, we'll have you. Yeah. Or or they'll say, you know, what's the rate, and then I'll I'll tell them what the rates are, and some say, well, we can't do that. But it's not that they don't want me. What are the rates? Just out of curiosity. Uh, you're you're afraid to mention them. I don't want to. You can't them. negotiate after you do it public. All right, we'll yeah. do uh, you do it do it <laughs> off air. I, I'm just curious what it is. Uh, but yeah, it that's... does. But just what I can say is that it it does it is it does change quite a bit because you have a sliding scale. I have an absolute sliding scale, depending Be- on depending on what number of students, depending on corporate, depending yeah. on what the budget is. Mm. Um, and and I, really, I want to make it beneficial for all parties. Got it. So in, in the end, I'm like, can it work for me? Can it work for the theater or college or whatever? And if we can make it all work, is it you know is it been a, is it does it give value to the students and does yeah. it give value to everybody involved? And if it does, then great, yeah, we'll go forward. And what those amounts of 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 for money, what those these can change because the values can change. Got it. Okay. Yeah, that, that makes sense. Yeah. Well, that's pretty cool, man. I think that's amazing to have the freedom to go do that. And you just like yeah. research. You just do your own research and just message people and. Mm-hmm. All that kind of stuff. So then I'll put a tour together, or I, or I won't, or I'll just go fly out to one place and come back. Got it. Um, and I, yeah, but I've I've generally stayed in Chicago for the past year and a half because of my pooch being yeah, being, being sick. sick. So I'm like, yeah, I mentioned staying. this beforehand. But I was gonna do a whole tour this year because I thought he was gonna be gone. Oh man. But I'm I'm glad he's not gone. But I was like, <laughs> people have been like, why aren't you coming to Europe? And I'm like, I well, my dog. Uh, yeah. It's well, a noble. Yeah. Reason. <laughs> The poor guy. He's sweet uh, and crazy, but yeah. sweet. <laughs> I am. Um, I'm thinking about putting together a, a tour into. I've never been to Scandinavia, and um, I was talking to. I'm doing this launching this other podcast that I've mentioned a couple of times uh, on this pod already called Funny Planet, where we're I'm interviewing just comedians, stand up comics, mostly stand up comics, but just all comedians from all over the world. That's the other thing I was going to say is like you, you were. To, we were talking about this. We like, had made the same idea almost at the same time. Yeah. Too. Yeah, yeah. Because I was like, w- w- wait, what? Yeah, well, that's what we had talked about. I had um, we d- I shot that pilot in um Iceland, and then I was like showing that stuff to you, I think. But like that was you the had I-, I would actually when we met at the Troubadour, yeah. I was talking to you about the idea that I had. Oh yeah. And then you said it's so funny because I'm actually shooting. <laughs> I'm this actually thing doing that. It's just like that. <laughs> and I was like, really? Yeah. So it was interesting. That I told you the idea, yeah. but you had already done it. Yeah, we had recorded the uh, we had recorded the pilot episode in Iceland in Reykjavik. Um, in March of that year, I'd quit my job. It was a fucking insane. It has been crazy though since this. Anyway, uh, and we're still working, moving forward with people. I'm flying out to LA next week to meet with the um advisor from Netflix on the project. Oh, and, currently? Um, yeah. Oh, good. Well, I mean, we'll see. Well, you never know. But he, he's hope- he's an advisor. Let me put, let me caveat this. He's an advisor on the project. He is also at Netflix. In his capacity as advisor on the project, he is not representing Netflix. <laughs> mm, okay, but, but I still hope for the he won hope an, for the best. He won an Emmy worst. last year, so Great. that was pretty cool. And I, I mean, I'm just excited to see him and talk further about this stuff. When I explain the likelihood of projects getting picked up to people, I'm I explain like it's very low. Yeah, but that doesn't mean it's a bad thing. It's no. just like. It's just what it is. Yeah, yeah. It, well, it's like it's like going out into a field and catching a shooting star in your baseball mitt. Like it's it's it can it could happen. It could happen. <laughs> it could happen. It's very low likelihood, but it could happen. Yeah, it's kind of like crazy to think about because it people who aren't the way that uh, and the producers guide with Todd Garner. The way that Todd Garner talks about it is he's like, you have to love this. You have to love your projects so much that it actually doesn't make sense and you have to love doing them so much and be involved with it so much that it actually goes beyond the borders of rationality because right. the likelihood that any of them are going to work out is so low. Right. And so, I mean, what's kind of cool in it is that it's provided me with a lot of, you know, connections and to talk with people. I wouldn't be in, I wouldn't have talked, I would never gone to New York television festival. I would have never met with a bunch of executives at True TV, at Funny or Die, at Comedy Central, Mm -hmm. at Canal Plus, at any of this shit. I wouldn't be launching this podcast now, like where I'm interviewing people and comedians and stuff. I wouldn't have gone to Reykjavik, Iceland. I wouldn't know the Icelandic community. 
Um, I wouldn't have be thinking about doing a tour of Scandinavia. Like none of that shit would have happened if I had never done this. I like Scandinavia. I would have had like probably like twenty grand more in in, in the bank. <laughs> if you're doing a Scandinavian tour, I and for some reason you have a another person to jump on this tour, I'm I'm in because I I do I I know a lot of people that want me in Scandinavia. Yeah, and I keep needing reasons to go. Yeah, well, let's let's talk about it because like that, it's something that I I really think I want to do and um. You know, I the, the just a lot of my friends who have done comedy over there are like, oh yeah, if you're an American, they're excited to see they you do comedy. They are very excited. Yeah, and they're so great. They're so nice. And They'll actually fucking pay you to see your show. Well, yeah, because their their money they have a lot of it, and they, it's and it's uh they 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 have a high standard of living. Yeah, it's just wild. I think like the 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 amount of comedy shows I've not gotten paid on is so much greater. <laughs> Yes. So much out, so way heavily weighted to that direction. <laughs> mm-hmm. So now going back again. Yeah. Sorry. Go uh, ahead. No, it's okay. Uh, go on, you, uh, I keep answering your initial question to to completion. Uh, <laughs> Let's do it. We we'll make the so, whole podcast. I like it. So we so going from there, uh, teaching musical improv, but also performing at more festivals, um, and and then also working on digital content, creating more digital content. Now. Got it. Um. And so that's, I think that's it. And it comes down to capitalism yep. of like, I need to make money, but also I don't want to do anything I don't, I'm not excited about. Yep. But how do I give value to people? And how do I give value to people is I can teach them what I have, with the knowledge that I have, I can, sure. I can teach them. And so that g- brings me income. And then I can, I can make music that people like and that affects their you know society or whatever else and that i get money from that i perform live at at speakeasies and cabarets in chicago those do really well for me because i'm comedic music so it's like a variety performer yeah so i've had to find these niches and that's kind of where i'm at now is is realizing okay there's for any me or any other artist comedian or painter or whatever else there's no there's no one thing yeah it's always a bunch of things and how do you how do you bring value into your life and how do you keep making income to fulfill that and also fulfill other people's lives oh man this is exactly i mean you're yeah i i relate to this so hard because i feel like (laughs) i just like i ended up quitting my job at the uh big the company i was working at when we met in in uh london I quit working there because it was like it was consuming my entire life. I had no time to do almost any other activities. And I finally was like, you know what? I can't live like this. Like I'm making I'm making really good money, which is great. And I shouldn't complain about the job too much because it, you know, afforded me to shoot and basically produce that pilot. And, Mm -hmm. you know, and, and afforded me a whole lot of like travel. I was able to put money in the bank get some like financial security, which I'd never had before in my life. And like that, that was all great. Mm -hmm. But you know, that being said, it was like, I had no f- time or energy to put into any creative outlets. Right. And I was like, I can't do this. Like, I yep. can't, I can't, I, I cannot do this. I have, this is too important to me. And it's weird. Cause I talk about this with people sometimes. It, I, I, w- I almost wish I didn't have that. Didn't I have the, the, the desire to do cr- create, put energy and time into creative projects uh, mm, and, mm-hmm. because I feel like I, I genuinely, it would be an easier life if you didn't ha- have the desire True. Our, it, our system is set up to not have that yeah and it makes no <laughs> sense like and, and because of the way the capital system is that we live in there are people who have had through you know by hook or by crook or by luck have like ended up in a position early where they were getting lots of attention mm-hmm. for the for for doing any of this sort of stuff and it's it's a total accident right but and, it doesn't mean it lasts forever for them no that's true but it's also weird because it's like if you if you're not, if you don't get caught in one of those positions, it's very difficult to True. do any. I think, let me give you another example that isn't this podcast or comedy or any of this shit. I write articles on Cora.com. And I just refer to this one. The best article I wrote, I think, is the history of stand up comedy and why specifically Richard Pryor is this landmark. People still look at him as this landmark of like stand up comedy. Um, and I go through the whole history of from vaudeville all the way to Richard Pryor and then beyond. And talk about why he's this like landmark. I think it's the best article I've ever, ever written. Doesn't have the most, 
doesn't get the most attention. But th- let's set that to the side for one second. That's part of the reason I like answering questions on Quora is just to, to go through the process of them. I've had like millions of reads on Quora, millions. They just sent one of my answers the other day. They emailed me 2.3 million people they sent it out to. I've made zero money from Quora. Right. Zero. And we live in this world right now where this is like so normal for some reason mm-hmm. that you're everybody here. I think all the people producing YouTube, like tons of shit. This podcast I've done for two years and didn't start it to try to make any money. But like I have put this out for years and it's never made a dime. It co- It's only a, a, a sink in terms of cost for me. And it feels like there are, that's just the world we live in. And it's weird to look at like Scandinavia just to return to this where it's like, You know, there's so many people in Chicago right now, and I'm sure you're one of them, where it's like, even if you make money doing some shows, the number of times you perform for nothing is, like, so high, and... That's actually not true for me. Is it not? (laughs) Okay. I I say no a lot to gigs. Well, good. I mean, you're... you're, That's an envious position to be in, but I think, like, for the the average sort of... But that's because that's why I stopped doing stand-up. Yeah. I didn't. Well, I never did stand up, but that's why I stopped doing stand up venues because I would. It, yeah. It, it, the value I was spending too much time there, mm. and not and I wasn't getting enough income value, and so I was I needed to switch it. Yeah. Well, I mean, I think that's a wise choice then because it feels like that's a real, like it's something that everybody in the world of stand up specifically is it deals with. It's like, oh yeah, like they pay they pay most clubs pay performers hardly anything. And it, yes. Even when they're headlining, sometimes even I mean, especially fe- especially if they're just featuring or hosting. Right. Or there's I remember in when I was eighteen, I uh, I was at somebody's graduation party, and there were two comedians that got booked for, to perform at the party, and I realized during the guy's set that, and he's one of the jokes, the punchline was like, <clears throat> he was like, I was I was this big dude. He was like, I'm a black man. And what did he say? He was like, "I'm a black man, and uh, it's so cold. I, I can't, I can't take the cold. It was so cold that uh, my nipple fell off, fell off. And I looked down, and I thought it was a milk dud. The punchline <laughs> was that he thought it was a milk dud, and that in my mind connected to remembering I'd seen that on Comedy Central. Uh, and I talked to him afterward, and I was like, "Hey, I didn't. You were off, you were on Comedy Central, and I I wanted to get a lot of information from him because I was sure. going to move to Chicago. And yeah. I was really excited." And he gave me this really jaded answer of, you know, they paid me X amount for that. I've never seen any more. And they pay, they play that all the they fucking play time. that comedy special all the time. And I never see any extra from it. And here I am playing at a graduation party. <laughs> oh, man. And yeah. I, he was like, this is what it is. Yeah. And I was as an 18 year old, I was like, oh, my God. God. At least you knew that then. I mean, I kind of knew that. I think it's part of the reason. I still went. I was like, all right. I think it's part of the reason I flirted with doing comedy my whole life because I started doing stand up when I was 16. I just posted the interview I did with Mark Ridley from the Comedy Castle. Mm-hmm. Um, I I knew him since I was 16. I had two uncles who were stand up comics. Mm-hmm. And I think I kind of knew what it would be like because I just was like, shit, this is just, it's a slog. But Jerry, Jerry Seinfeld has this great story about um, Glenn Miller. Um, I don't know if you've ever heard this. I have not. Glenn Miller uh, was on a train with all of his, um, with his whole orchestra. Everybody's on it, and they're on this train, and um, they're about to make it to this town, this little town in the Midwest. It's the middle of winter, mm-hmm. and just as the train is about to get to the town, the train breaks down, and they can see the town. It's across this big muddy field of snow and all this stuff, and. And they go, we got to be at this venue in like an hour. <laughs> like, what are we doing? And so they go, all right, fine. Everybody grab your instruments. And they get their instruments and they start walking really? across this gross, muddy field in the middle of the wintertime. And the snow is coming down and uh, everybody's shoes are gross. And nobody has like the right you know, equipment to be walking across. They don't have rubber boots or anything. Right. So they're getting all soaked and it's totally miserable. And they're halfway across. They're, some of them are lugging these big instruments with them. Right. And as they're walking across this field... They turn and they see this little farmhouse and in the farmhouse there's this family and they're sitting down to a dinner and it's really nice and warm and and, uh, they can see that there's like a turkey dinner on the table and the husband's like carving it up and he's handing it to his wife and his kids. And one of the musicians turns to the other one and he goes, the way some people live (laughs) and keeps walking. And I I feel like I love it because the whole point of it is it's like (laughs) you can't, I don't know, I guess you can't do it any other kind of way. (laughs) <laughs> it's yeah 
Yeah, the life of a performer is is uh, weird, thankless. I think in many ways. <laughs> but I but I think that in in going going back of of you know that's the way it is, and that's the income that's made is 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 sometimes great, and then suddenly sparse is is the way for I would say most artists. Yeah, not all, but most, and which is where I think you know Jack Conti who is the musician who created Patreon. Yeah. I think he was trying to figure out... A, How can a, we do something so that people he was, can get paid? He yeah. he had spent... I mean, the, the point for him was he had spent $10,000 on creating a video, like a really intense video on the set, and, and it put so much time into it. And then he, he was like, How do I... I'm, I'm only going to make maybe $200 from it. Yeah. <laughs> And he did in the end. In the end, off of YouTube monetization, he didn't make much. Oh yeah. And but he had, but at the same time, he had had with a friend developed Patreon, and then he was hoping that it was a way that he because he knew he was going to get an insane amount of views. Yep. And then he was putting value in people's lives by them enjoying it. But he was like, "Will they put? Will those people that are enjoying it? Yeah. Then give back and say, <laughs> I, I, you know, I'll give a dollar, give whatever it is, and to to help you create more things. And then soon after that he had he had within i think two weeks he had made five thousand off of the patreon yeah off of this, which is the first ever patreon page he was just testing it and then the the company he had the video that we made was called pedals and it, it featured a lot of these pedals from a company that he worked for years ago that he was hoping to make money from and never did and yeah he was really bummed about it but then because he'd made this really cool video that featured all the pedals even though he wasn't getting paid by the company for it, the CEO had seen it, saw how many views he got, and then saw his plea at the end to say, I, you know, I'm asking people to put this money in to this Patreon, I'm testing it out. Hopefully, you know, we could do this together. And then the CEO wrote him a check for $5,000. Well, that's nice. So within two weeks, he had made up that amount. Yeah. But I mean, like, I, I reflect on my own experience. I created a comedy special that I self-produced did it at the mc the musical comedy mcl mcl theater now defunct Mm -hmm. all it needed was one special for me to take it down uh (laughs) and uh same thing put post it out on youtube thousands of people watch it zero have received zero ever probably will from it i don't know if it's even gotten me a single gig or anything other i mean who knows how this stuff works out the point i'm making isn't to tell a woe is me story i guess the point the point is that who the fuck knows where any of this stuff is going? You know right, what I mean? Correct. Like you got no idea the where where things are going to end up or where they're not going to end up or what's going to catch or what's not going to catch mm-hmm. or like any of that stuff. But I think the 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 thing for me is it just feels like it's it's good to just create stuff. I think it's cool that you're in a position to go around kind of you know wherever you want t- teaching. Uh, that is, and then very doing nice. shows and things like this. Yeah, my wife, uh, who's she runs a modern dance company. She was like, "Do you know?" But I can't do that, and I've been running this company for 15 years. And I was like, okay, not like I haven't been working in comedy world for that, yeah, for longer than that. But, but I was like, I understand, honey. And she's like, it would be nice. I love traveling, yeah, and you want to stay home. She's I, like, my girlfriend's the same she's thing. Like, it would be nice if I could just yeah. ask anybody. And okay, I was like, yes, it would be nice, babe. <laughs> she's my girlfriend. Similar, she teaches yoga, teaches yoga all over the city, and she's like, I can't go anywhere and teach just teach yoga. I'm like, well. You know, you're not trying to build a brand around <laughs> mm-hmm. around doing that. Mm-hmm. Oh man, uh, we're hitting up on the hour, dude. If people want to follow you or or check you out or follow in your stuff, where can they uh, go? Oh, I'd say you can go to mattgriffo.com. It's m a t t g r i f f o dot com. Or I update my Instagram pretty regularly, so there's that. I uh, have Patreon dot com slash mattgriffo, and uh, the U- YouTube. Spotify, Apple Music, any of those, um, SoundCloud, but it, my my Patreon actually you can you can actually just make an account on there and then just follow different people. Yeah, you don't have to actually pay anyone, financially yeah. back them because there because there will be public posts too. And I actually follow I back certain people on Patreon, and but I also I probably follow quadruple that amount mm. because I'm I don't have an I don't have however I don't have like a hundred dollars to just like. Yeah, with that many people to yeah to, <laughs> to dole just out. shoot around. Yeah, but it's I'll really follow, I'll follow a lot of people on Patreon for a dollar. 
I do that. Yeah. Like if there's any, because I feel like even a dollar a month is like something that yeah is like worth tossing at somebody. Right. But yeah, doing that, uh, I'm creating a, a podcast. It's literally better than zero, and it makes a huge fucking difference to the people who you're who you're following. Even even if that money isn't substantial enough to like change any material process of their life, just having anybody who's like I, around you who's like I'm willing to pay to see you. It actually or, does help. Yeah. Uh, you know, it does. Yeah. No, the no amounts do help. So go to the Madness Continues Patreon. No. <laughs> the. The what was I saying? Oh, is that um? So I'm, I'm creating a podcast. It's a musical podcast where somebody tells a story, a true story, a, like a, that's well known, and then musical improvisers improvise songs to the story. Oh, that's and a great that's idea. That's how it continues the the tale. That's a great fucking idea. Ah, uh-huh. it's a well known true story though. It's like a story from history or something. Mm-hmm. Oh my god, I want to do this so bad. Yeah, well, you can be a storyteller. On I the would. Show. Lo- oh my god, Matt, I would love to do this so bad. So that's that's I'm pretty excited about it. And they can follow you on the Patreon to learn more about that. Yeah, I'm gonna I'm gonna make it's gonna be just included in that. So I'm gonna any of the posts I'll just post on there, and that'll be that'll be public. Dope. Well, I'm gonna I'll have this all in the show notes so everybody can follow you and all that stuff. Cool. Um, but man, otherwise, thanks for showing up, dude. This is good to catch up with you and. Yeah, that's fun. Is, oh, the ice is coming off your roof now. <laughs> it's like melting off the roof. Yeah, we got the. It's about like, time. It's supposed to be like forty something, like tomorrow or something. It's like twelve out right now. It's, yeah, it's really cold it's, right now. This uh, Chicago fucking weather, man. This is so bad. I was just telling somebody this the other day. Is that when uh, you remember the uh, winter from thirteen to fourteen in uh in the Midwest? Twenty thirteen. Twenty thirteen to th- twenty fourteen. Yeah, and not not nineteen thirteen and nineteen fourteen. <laughs> I don't particularly not remember. Like, it. Oh, the the world, the first world war was going on, or it was it was just about to start? And uh, not eighteen, thirteen, or fourteen either. When Napoleon was in in Europe, uh, what, why what happened? Well, it was just a really bad winter. It was just really bad. My grandfather was born in nineteen thirty, and I remember. So he's like 84, 83, 84, and he was like, "This is the worst winter I can remember." <laughs> and anyway, I mentioned that because like this in November, this is how it was then too. Right. And so I'm like, "This is gonna be a fucking worse winter." Like it's just gonna. I'm just really worried about how this is gonna end. It's up. interesting that the uh, as I go around the world, yep, everybody. Every but every country, uh, uh, in Iceland, in Indonesia, in uh, Spain, wherever, everybody's like, weather's crazy. <laughs> this isn't we. This is weird, and it, and it and it's both ways. It's like super cold and also extremely hot. Yeah, and it's and yeah. So well, you heard our president. Those are just a Chinese hoax. Giant. The weather's never been more stable. My dad thinks the same thing, and so does he really? So I, you know, it's gotta be true. <laughs> it's gotta be true dad rochester new york man he would know uh when that, i was in hawaii with him he goes there's chemtrails and i was like what, what? you know what chemtrails are right yeah of course and then just so if you don't know what chemtrails are people think that the trails that that planes make the white lines which are actually condensation because of the heat and there's and it's cold up there it creates condensation so it's essentially creating clouds that's the scientific what's happening but what they think is that it's they're actually <laughs> releasing chemicals that are affecting either people or they're or releasing chemicals to affect the the weather of the world so that's what they think i mean techni- technically they are my dad <laughs> like with co2 and whatever but anyway sorry i didn't mean to interrupt uh, so, so dad. my dad thinks that and he when we were in hawaii there were no he was like look at the sky and i was like what he's like there's no no there's no chemtrails <laughs> and he's like they're not he's like they're not spraying here and i was like no dad and I went on my phone and I looked up chemtrails Hawaii and I was like, look, there's a ton of photos of, of people thinking that here oh because planes exist. Yeah. And then uh, he was like, oh, no, it's here, too. And I was like, no, that's not the point. That's <laughs> not the point of what you're supposed to get from. from oh, this. my God. He should be my dad. He just I'm, my dad's not a conspiracy theorist, like, really. But it almost feels like if you talk to him for long enough, some shit will come out that you're like, dad, that's not real. Like, it's just. <laughs> Like, he'll just be, like, he just, like, because if you bring it up and you're like, man, you know, people believe that, like, lizards run the government, Dad. Isn't that crazy that, like, Alex Jones and my dad's like, that's retarded. How can anybody believe that? And then later my dad will be like, you know, like, they're putting chemicals in beef that, like, actually can, like, <laughs> fuck up your whole. And you're like, what the, what? Yeah, no, it's not just the antibiotics. It's, like, some other. I'm like, what are you talking, what the fuck are you talking about? Like, it's, it, was, my dad's such a unique guy. He's like, you'd like him. He, um, he, he owns and planted and created his own vineyard in his own yard in Northern Michigan. Wow. Yeah. He bought a genetically engineered grape by the university of Minnesota. He's like one of a handful of people in the United States to buy this grape and plant these vines 
that in the next few years. It's a special cold weather grape. It's called the Marquette grape. He just knows all about it. I should have him on the podcast again. You should have him on the podcast. The univ- the, that Minnesota, they just keep releasing genetically altered uh, things that everybody wants to eat. Like, yeah. Like um, honey crisp apples. Yeah. Gen- from, from Minnesota. Genius. These guys. People love those things. Yeah, right? What a, a better better living through chemistry. <laughs> uh, all right. Take it easy, Matt Griffo. Thanks for dropping by. Thanks. Thanks so much for listening to the Madness Continues podcast. Once again, this is Brendan Lemon. If you liked what you listened to, please take a minute to like, to subscribe, to give us a rating. It really does mean a difference. I say us like there's more than one person doing this. Uh, It's just me, everybody. So every little bit of support you can lend would be really appreciated by me. If you want to share this podcast, it would really, really, really mean a lot to me. I hope you come back. I hope you listen and check out the other podcast I produce, Funny Planet, where we talk to different comedians from all over the world about what they're doing and how they are funny in their own cultures. You can learn a thing or two and you'll have a laugh too. Anyway, take care. Take it easy. We'll see you here next time.